Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Asia Mason, and <clears throat> I am zooming in from my home out by Lake LaBarge. Um, and I'm sorry, I couldn't be there in the flesh today. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Yukon Status of Women Council. So we are a not for profit organization, not non governmental organization that's been operating for over 50 years. I guess this is our 50th year. <clears throat> Today, as you can see from the title in front of you, we're going to be talking about the Yukon socioeconomic data gaps and its implications for evidence-based decision-making. Uh, our mandate as an organization is to promote gender equity and systemic change using the tools of community-based research, policy analysis, as well as education. And you're gonna see some really great examples of why this particular topic is so dear to our hearts. Um, so I couldn't choose which quote to put up because they're both so good. Uh, on the one hand, we've got data, uh, data being positioned not just as data or being about data, but it's a very arrangement of power, profit, inclusion, equality, and basically the foundation of what structures our society. My mom, Shannon Olson, uh, she works at the Yukon Archives, and she dug up this quote from Thomas Berger. Some of the folks in the room might remember in the late 70s during the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline inquiry, uh, Thomas Berger was somebody who uh, was pretty loud about the limitations on data, especially socioeconomic data in relationship to how justifications could be put forward for this particular pipeline's development. And he, um, in 1977 said, the systems of data collection in the Yukon and the North um, do not meet the purpose of measuring or evaluating output. They do not work well, and they will probably not work well in the future or work less well in the future. So let's just remember that this is going on, yeah, over 40 years ago. So, Let's just break some of these concepts down. On the one hand, we have socioeconomic data. So some people that might say that those are raw facts and figures that can relate to the social and economic sort of fabric within a given society. So some of the examples that we often are familiar with um, include things like income level, employment status, job types, educational status, housing conditions. <clears throat> pardon me, demographics, things like age, sex, ethnicity, health stats, all of these are examples of socioeconomic data. Now, in this infographic in front of you, you'll notice that there's a whole slew of dots at the top, call them stars. And notice also that the funnels, or the singular funnel there is not capturing any of the yellow dots. So the only thing that's really showing up or being collected as evidence are the, the teal and the blue dots. The yellow dots are completely excluded. We can think of we can think of socioeconomic data as being those inputs that form the key indicators and in turn form how it is that we measure the efficacy of different policy decisions. However, as we're gonna explore through this talk, we will see very shortly just how limited we are with respect to the quality of socioeconomic data in the Yukon. What that does in turn is it triggers a bit of a cascade. If we don't have very robust socioeconomic data, how then are we formulating evidence and how are we measuring the impact of the kinds of policy decisions that we make. And in turn, how do we transform those limited evidence into key indicators that actually measure the performance of the population? So for us as an organization, we are in the business of, like I mentioned earlier, promoting gender equity, and we use research to do that. So we've spent quite a lot of time contemplating what it is that constitutes rigorous and quality data, especially in the context of the Yukon. 
um, number one, as you can see in front of you, we believe that quality socioeconomic data is disaggregated, meaning that we can determine different combinations of that first gray ring around the person in the blob. So aspects of identity are considered in relationship to the systems of power, that second blue ring, as well as institutions and structures. So disaggregated data is data that allows us to know, for example, both the gender and the ethnicity of an individual within that population. An intersectional analysis is essentially a way for us to glean the relationship between institutions and structures, systems of power, and those individual aspects of identity. So for example, how does an Indigenous woman in the Yukon, how does her experience with the education system or the political system or the economic system, how does that manifest? And so this, this kind of consideration is called an intersectional analysis. The third criteria for us in terms of what constitutes quality socioeconomic data are data that you can access. So we're not going to go too deep down the rabbit hole, but in any place that has a small population, um, we're always going to face what Paul Kizchak has kind of popularized this notion that big N is smaller than little n. So if you're familiar with statistics, a place like the Yukon, the population size is often too small to generate statistically significant outcomes. That is to say, quantitative kinds of methodologies are often not applicable or methodologies that end up having a lot of limitations and as far as they can tell you what's happening in the, in the lived experiences of people in the Yukon. So the takeaway from this slide is that from our perspective, what constitutes quality socioeconomic data in the Yukon are data that are disaggregated, meaning that we can tell different aspects of a person's identity, like their gender and their ethnicity. ethnicity. It's intersectional, i.e. we can examine the relationships that exist between aspects of identity and the various other structural features, and it also needs to be accessible. So the title of this presentation talks about evidence-based decision-making. So we definitely need to get our definitions straight here. So for us, evidence-based decision-making is a process that involves systematically reviewing and using the best available evidence to inform and guide policy decisions, practice, management, and at the, at the end of the day, how money is flowed. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna start getting into some of the meat of this presentation. And I just wanna give folks a heads up that we're gonna be looking at examples of sexualized violence, violence, the opioid overdose epidemic, and in particular, how indigenous women in the Yukon are experiencing disproportionate levels of sexualized violence, violence, and overdose. What I'm hoping folks can keep in mind as we're going through these examples is question whether or not these data are disaggregatable, as in, is it disaggregated? Are you able to tell things about both a person's gender, for example, and their ethnicity? Are we able to conduct any kind of um, intersectional analysis when we're examining some of these examples? <clears throat> so, the most recent example is from a report that we put out last month or at the end of September. This project involved us examining the impacts of COVID on women and women identified folks in the Yukon in relationship to their well being as well as their livelihoods. So, this was a huge project. It was funded by the Yukon government as well as the federal government. In this project, we had five unique data sources, if you will. We did 148 interviews, um, I should say surveys, and we got 148 responses. We conducted two and a half to three hour long interviews with folks, um, 51 of them in total. Then we also got data from Stats Canada, the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, and the Yukon Bureau of Stats. 
And one of the hugest ramifications of this project was yet another example of the limitations, the fundamental limitations on the current frameworks that are in use in places like the Yukon with respect to socioeconomic data. What we tried to do in this project is uh, compel various external data sources like YBS, the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, Stats Can Data, and as much as we could, we wanted to get disaggregated data. We wanted to understand how in particular were and are Indigenous women in the Yukon being impacted or have they been impacted by COVID-19, especially as it relates to well-being and, and livelihood. We were not able to obtain any disaggregated data from the three external data sources. And so if we were to contrast or compare those findings from both the surveys that we conducted and the in-depth in interviews that we conducted, we saw something that was completely rendered invisible in the other data sources. We saw pronounced differences between the impacts on Indigenous versus non-Indigenous women. I just pulled figure 19, or sorry, it's 18 from the report, and you can see in relation to food security and issues related to housing, we saw massive differences between what Indigenous women reported versus what Caucasian women reported. This is super important because those three external data sources did not reveal any of this information. So I'm not sure we're going to have time to actually go into this, but I'm going to invite folks to explore the Yukon government's gender equity indicators website. And as you're going through the website, I want to invite you to consider of the of all of the indicators that are included, there, there's only one that actually breaks down the impacts of both gender and indigeneity examines the combination of gender and indigeneity, and that relates specifically to female homicides. So this is absolutely born out of MMIWG inquiry and all of the calls to justice. What is unfortunate in my mind is that the there, the absence of data other than Indigenous women who are already dead is the only data included in the representation of gender equity indicators. And there's there's some legitimate reasons for that. I'm not saying that there aren't. Um, here's another example, and I'm just going to zoom in so folks can see. This is a report published May 5th from the Chief Coroner's Office. Um, You'll notice that in the data that are presented between April 7th and the 27th, so over the course of 20 days, we saw six, um, sorry, we, we were able to determine from this report who died, but not very much information about anything more rich, anything more com combinatorial about their aspects of identity. So for example, we don't know from this report or from any of the reports that come out of the chief coroner's office, and I'm not ragging on Heather Jones. There's a lot of really legitimate reasons and, and legislative reasons why sh her office cannot publish data on this, but we can't tell how many Indigenous women died. This is just a screenshot from StatsCan. Um, specifically, this is looking at the number of occurrences or incidents of sexualized violence in Watson Lake. And as you can see, we have the number of sexualized assaults, but we don't know much about the gender or the indigeneity or any other information about who it who experienced that level of violence. Now, I'm just going to kind of bring this all together and zoom in on this is this is a decision document for the Kudzakaya project. And notice that one of the accepted recommendations from Yaseb for the proponent, DMC Minerals, was for them to 
co-create a program that will deter determine the extent to which their project, the Kudzukai project, will have effects that are associated with violence against women with special considerations for Indigenous women in Watson Lake and Ross River. And so we'll just flip back to this previous slide. And are we able to tell how many Indigenous women, for example, reported sexualized violence in Watson Lake, not from the data that are available? We cannot. And so this is just a glowing example of a decision that was perhaps made without an awareness or recognition of the limitations of, of socioeconomic data or what data are available. So this is a very quick and dirty kind of encapsulation of what the implications are of low quality socioeconomic data. We know that misrepresentation of reality can occur. Um, that is, we can have inaccurate or incomplete data uh, that can result in a not very accurate reflection of reality or the real conditions of the people who are living in that space. <clears throat> it can also, of course, lead to inadequate addressing of issues. So if key socioeconomic indicators are not accurately captured due to poor data quality because policies may fail to address the actual issues, we're, we're essentially going to have exactly that, the inability to effectively respond to the issues that are happening. We're also gonna have resource misallocation, <clears throat> pardon me. So that means that we can have decisions that are based on flawed data and it can lead to the inappropriate allocation of resources either by overlooking those folks who are, you know, in the margins of the margins and aren't captured in these typical sort of colonial data frameworks and data nets. And ultimately it can lead to lack of trust and a lack of compliance. When we know that policies are derived from low quality data, we have a tendency to lose faith in, in that institution. Um, that institution or government can lose credibility and it can ultimately lead to reduced public trust and and therefore compliance and whatever that means. So for us, we want to situate the work that we do to leverage a, a more robust and more creative approach to data in, in, in the North. And that for us starts with how it is that we define evidence in policy and legislation. So for example, at a federal level, the Canadian government has very clear and explicit wording with respect to how regulations are written as they're interpreted from acts such that evidence and evidence-based decision-making is prioritized. And while the Yukon is young in a colonial sense and the various orders of government that exist in this space are all in the process of developing these kinds of data governance frameworks and approaches to how we ought to more accurately measure what's happening for people in the Yukon, I think it's very important for us to consider how we word and concretize the importance of evidence in legislation itself. <clears throat> so not only broader definitions of evidence, but also mixed methods approaches to acquiring quote unquote data. So for us, we like to kind of envision ourselves as the folks who are kind of paving this yellow road alongside many other advocates who work hard to amplify the voices of those who are not captured in your standard data nets. Um, mixed methods approaches involve things like community-based research and participatory action, but it also involves gaining access to the quantitative or like socioeconomic data that does exist and being able to build off of that 
recognize the gaps that are fundamentally there and are not fixable and bolstering around that. Um, we also see a huge need for capacity building in the territory and by capacity building as it relates to data and socioeconomic indicators and evidence-based policy making or decision making for us that means data literacy understanding that we need to increase how much the average yukoner understands about about data we are consistently relying on data that is omitting entire swaths of the Yukon's population because of things like privacy legislation or cell suppression rules, or just, you know, not having a very cohesive definition of what constitutes evidence. You said you just, you have about a minute or two, so just want to give you that. Thank you. <clears throat> That's perfect. That's so perfect. Um, okay, so I never thought, <clears throat> pardon me, that I would ever quote John Maynard Keynes, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, but he's an economist, an old, what do they say, male, stale, pale, dead dude. Um, and I mean, he did nail this. There is nothing a government hates more than to be well-informed, for it makes the process of arriving at decisions much more complicated and difficult. We know that's true in this space, but the Yukon prides itself on being a trailblazer. We have for a very long time. And I think that we have an opportunity to really set the standard for rural, remote, and northern spaces as we try to increase the efficacy and responsiveness of the decisions that we make at a macro scale or at a macro level and honor the fact that community-based research, listening to the local context, believing what people say without them having to report formally to these more co colonial and I think inaccessible a lot of the time data collection processes. So I'm gonna leave it there because I could talk about this for a very long time. <clears throat> Thanks, Asia. We'll just see if there's any questions from folks online or in the room. And for what it's worth, anybody who starts out a presentation quoting Thomas Berger has instant street cred in my world. <laughs> I know. Right? It's so good. It's it so, good. so good. He That's was fantastic. like, I was like so young when that, well, I was born in 83, but I just remember both my parents just being like so struck by that whole process. And I just love that he's, he's still relevant in so many ways. <laughs> Questions for Asia on, on a lot of really important deep information there. Some of you are reaching and scratching your head, but I, I'm like ready to go. Good. We have a question for you, Asia. Hi, hi, Asia. Uh, my name is Emma Eaton, and um, I just through your presentation, you kind of um, I think quite generously said a number of times like there's some pretty good reasons for this. Like I'm not gonna try and throw this person under the bus. And I just wondered like if you had any ideas for like some ways to do some workarounds or if what the reasons are and what ones are negotiable and what ones aren't, I guess. I don't I saw some sign language there, but I didn't catch it. Oh, you're on mute. That's great. We ask somebody a question for you and then <laughs> she's put something in the chat. <laughs> Help Stephanie. It worked. Did there it work? we go. You can hear me? Yes. Emma, thank you for that question. Um, so I think that we are in a world right now where data governance and data governance considerations are at the forefront. And I know that some of the folks who are already guest speakers at this conference are talking a lot about that. Um, I think for us, what we believe our workarounds is being able to have a legally binding 
commitment, regardless of what political party is in power in the Yukon, I'm talking about specifically here, where no matter what political parties in power, evidence in as much as we can define evidence and be very generous and, and broaden that definition of evidence to be less colonial, i.e. to include collaborations, community-based research, to recognize fundamentally that we're, we're never going to have access to a lot of the data that Southern jurisdictions have access to. Um, it behooves us as a territory to ensure that we engage in what I think is legislative reform so that evidence is not only defined and defined according to what the Yukon needs to define it as, but also to be really clear about how we go about collecting information, how that information becomes data, how that data then becomes key indicators in that whole policy life cycle so that we can support present and future governments and decision makers to rely on things that are going to elicit the most beneficial responses and ultimately support everybody in the community, especially those who are in the margins of the margins. I don't know if that answers your question, Emma. I'm seeing uh, yes, no. She has further questions, as do lots of people in the room, Asia. Uh, and you know what? It's your own fault, because if you'd done a, a really boring presentation, there'd be no questions, but there's lots of questions, which is great. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but I will refer you to uh, the chat. Tracy from Old Crow put a fantastic question in there. So Asia, I'm hoping you can answer her on the, the chat, if that's okay. And folks in the room, and virtually, if you can join me in just thanking Asia for a really impressive presentation. <laughs>